Shady's back. And I'm very sorry that I left, but I'm back! Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Tea Time Thoughts. I'm Kaylin, as always, which, with how much I've been gone lately, saying always sounds a little bit like a lie, but I am back, and I'm just going to throw out my little list of excuses for why I was away for so long. So I finally finished my thesis, which I got an A on, so I'm very happy with that. I'm very glad that it's over. That was a lot of long work. And I got started at a new job, and then my family came to visit me, and then I got quite sick for a while. And if you can kind of tell by my voice, or just sort of the way that I sound, I'm still a little bit on the sick side. And went through the whole scare of whether or not it was COVID, but twasn't so. Everything is good. And I have a new episode for you guys today. And no, it is not on The Great Gatsby because even though I am back, I am apparently still a liar. But one day, sooner or later, I will release this Great Gatsby episode. But I also have some really fun episodes that you guys will probably be able to look forward to soon. I have some collaborations in discussion right now. And if you guys enjoyed our Midnight Snack murder mystery podcast that I did with a group of friends, rest assured we have some more mysteries coming your way. So be sure to keep an eye out for that. And in the meantime, we have a bit of a scary tale for you tonight. And actually, just to shift this into a little bit more serious note, I want to give a content warning for this episode, we are going to get into some disturbing subjects regarding torture and murder. And if it's something you're not comfortable with, I would just recommend skipping this episode. If it makes you feel uncomfortable or unsafe, it's truly not worth ruining your day over this. Maybe go check out a more fun episode instead. Go check out my episode on Confucianism or William Wordsworth instead. You know, let your heart with pleasure fill and dance with daffodils. I promise those ones are so much more chill. Now, if you're feeling brave, turn off all the lights, wrap up in a blanket, and settle in for the chilling tale of Elizabeth Bathory, the Blood Countess. If you haven't heard the name of Elizabeth Bathory or Urchbet Bathory, I'm going to apologize in advance to my Hungarian listeners for however badly I pronounced that, and I'm going to stick with the more anglicized version of the pronunciations for most of the episode. If you haven't heard the name of Elizabeth Bathory, you may still know the legend that surrounds her, the story of the she-devil who, in order to keep her beauty, bathed in the blood of virgins. Now, in actuality, it's probably false that she did bathe blood, as the legend says, and it's also unverified of whether or not she actually did inspire Bram Stoker's Dracula, but what we do know about her is enough to make even the strongest stomach churn. So Elizabeth Bathory was born on the 7th of August, 1560, in the misty, swampy, forest-clad town of Nirbator in Hungary. One thing that is important to note is that Elizabeth was born into one of the most powerful families in Central-slash-Eastern Europe at the time. The family had something of a romanticized legend of how they actually came to be. They would say that in the year 900, a warrior named Vetus left to fight a dragon that lived in the swamps of Ixed. The warrior had killed the dragon with three thrusts of his lance, and to reward his bravery, he was honored with the land and the castle of the territory, as well as the name Bathory, which means either bravery or good hero. This legend is also reflected in the Bathory coat of arms, which has three teeth and a dragon biting its own tail. Now, Elizabeth's parents were actually members of two different sects of the Bathory clan, and they were wed in a political union which made their power insurmountable, and it also meant that Elizabeth would lead a very noble and somewhat privileged life. Now, it's a pretty common misconception you'll hear that her parents were very, very close relatives. They were distant relatives, but a lot of people are very quick to say, oh, her parents were first cousins, and that's why she ended up being as crazy as she was. That's something we can take off the table at this point point. So Elizabeth had a very privileged life, but even a privileged life is never free from turmoil. Hungary was under threat by both the Turks and the Habsburg dynasty, and external conflict aside, there were still many heated and often violent debates over religion, with the Reformation still in full swing throughout Europe. So one thing to bear in mind is that Elizabeth is growing up during a tumultuous time. And in spite of all this, Elizabeth was renowned for being very well educated in a time where some Hungarian nobles, like the man that she would eventually marry, didn't always have strong literacy in their own 
languages. They had people that would write their letters or read their letters to them. So you could afford to not be literate if you wanted to, rather than being illiterate as a consequence of a lack of resources, as many of the peasant class would face. And not only would Elizabeth be very literate, she also studied math and science and theology. And she was very active in her learning and was said to be quite adventurous and imaginative, but also thrown, also prone to throwing fits when she didn't get her own way. But at the age of 11, Elizabeth was engaged to Ferenc II of Nadezhdi, and Elizabeth would go on to marry him later in 1575, when she was about 14 or 15. So shortly after her engagement, Elizabeth was moved into her in-law's estate, and this was usual during the time to basically have the in-laws finish the upbringing of the bride-to-be and get familiar with the runnings of the household. And as far as Elizabeth's family life, the root of what may have caused Elizabeth's eventual sadism may have started young. There are a lot of rumors that perpetuate about her family life. Many of her family members were supposed to have similar issues. Her brother was supposedly a sex fiend who ran drunk and naked through marketplaces, and her uncle regularly struck at attackers who weren't there, and her aunt, who tortured her own servant, supposedly taught Elizabeth herself how to torture people. One occurrence that's regularly discussed in Elizabeth's childhood is her having witnessed a brutal execution at the age of six, wherein a man who was accused of selling his child to the Turks was sewn into a live horse and then thrown into a river. But these rumors can also just be that, rumors without much backing to them. Especially the one with the horse. It's very unlikely that that method of execution would have been used often unless the horse were either dead or sick because to use a live horse, it's at the time it's an incredible expense to kill somebody who by all means wasn't deemed worthy to live. But it's still likely that Elizabeth wasn't a stranger to violence given the time in which she lived. Being a noble, it would be common during this time to see some brutal treatment of those in the lower classes. Some sources say also that Elizabeth dealt with epilepsy as a child and was prone to seizures. And some treatments for the time would definitely sound strange to us now. If you've listened to my plague episode from way back when, you'll know that medical treatments of the past sound just as bad, if not worse, than the actual disease. So this illness would have been referred to as the falling sickness, and treatment for the falling sickness would have included drinking the blood of a non-sufferer with part of their ground-up skull mixed in, as well as topical application of the blood. So usually either on the skin or on the lips. And when it comes to this legend of Elizabeth later with her frantically or supposedly frantically collecting the blood of virgins, people think that maybe she did this because of her familiarity with the treatments of the time and that led her to do what she did. But even if she murdered just to obtain blood, it wouldn't explain why she took such a pleasure in torturing. But we're also very quick to want to jump onto some kind of abuse or trauma or proximity to violence and gore so that we can explain the monster that she became later in life. We find ourselves doing this a lot with people who become murderers later in life because we find comfort in being able to pinpoint, oh, this is why so-and-so happened, or we get A because of B. Because when we see someone who breaks the pattern, we get really concerned because we're uncomfortable with an answer that isn't concrete. And it's scary to think that perhaps somebody that seems normal to us could possibly be a killer. But it is possible that something more traumatizing could have happened to Elizabeth after her engagement. So Elizabeth met a man by the name of Laszlo or Ladislav Bend, and he was said to have been a very charismatic man and very chivalrous as well and very heroic, and there are apparently some disputes over whether or not Laszlo was a nobleman or a peasant boy, and allegedly Elizabeth gave birth to an illegitimate child at the age of 13 who was taken away by a woman close to the family. This woman was paid off, and she quietly took care of the child. Wham bam. Thank you, ma'am, for your service. But not only is there a debate over whether or not Laszlo was a nobleman, but there's also a debate of whether or not Elizabeth's involvement with him was entirely consensual. Now, this part of Elizabeth's story has been brought to light by an author named R.A. von Ellsberg, who wrote about Elizabeth in 1894. So according to von Ellsberg, supposedly Elizabeth was abducted by Laszlo, who then drugged her with hemp seed and raped her. And after this horrific crime, Elizabeth had to prove her virtue to a religious council in order to allow her marriage to take place. So she testified that she was taken against her will and assaulted. And when her name was cleared, her fiancé cut off Laszlo's bits and fed them to a pack of dogs. However, this gets sketchy because von Ellsberg cites his sources from a court case that happened in the year 1609, which would have made Elizabeth almost 50. So the timeline just 
doesn't work. So again, this could possibly disprove the entire story and it feeds further into the legend of Elizabeth and the question of whether or not she was driven to do what she did. But it usually is accepted that Elizabeth gave birth to a child that she wasn't able to keep. And beyond that, everything sort of clouded with doubt. So eventually, when Elizabeth was 15, she was officially married to Ferenc Narejdi, and the wedding was a massive affair. Apparently, 4,500 people attended. The Holy Roman Emperor was even invited, but alas, he couldn't attend and sent a lavish wedding gift to congratulate the young couple. But Elizabeth received quite the bridal gift from her new husband, a castle along with its accompanying 17 villages. What was also interesting is that Ferenc took Elizabeth's name because of how old and powerful her household was, thus becoming Ferenc Batari Narajdi. One thing to bear in mind, though, is that both Elizabeth and Ferenc's parents were dead by this point, and they had inherited their family fortunes. So they were the wealthiest couple that you could imagine. They were even wealthier than the King of Hungary himself. What's also crazy is that because Ferenc was often called away due to military service and the threat of the impending Turkish Ottoman army, Elizabeth basically had to govern all of their estates and manage her family household by herself. And not only did she do it, but she thrived. She was very clearly intelligent and she was confident in her ability to oversee things. And she managed things down to the minute details. She had, for the most part, a pretty set schedule when she could carve out time specifically for work, for family, once she and Ferenc had kids. She had time for recreational activities and entertaining guests. Elizabeth was also said to be incredibly beautiful, and one of the only portraits we see of her was copied numerous times. Now, it's kind of strange that somebody of Elizabeth's status only had one portrait, but one explanation for this is possibly due to safety measures, so that if somebody tried to kidnap Elizabeth for ransom, or if one of Ferenc's enemies tried to harm her, she would be less easy to identify. As for the marriage itself, by all account, it seemed to be successful. Elizabeth and Ferenc ultimately had four children together, although they didn't conceive for the first decade or so into their marriage, but the children went on to have successful marriages themselves. And even though Ferenc was often away on military duties, Elizabeth could count on a very big and marvelous celebration when he did return, and she lived a very comfortable life and was well cared for at the time of Ferenc's death in 1604 at the age of 48 due to an illness that that wasn't generally identified, but was precluded by the failing of his limbs. And honestly, at this time period, the age in which he died was considered fairly normal. So this should be an ordinary story of a wealthy couple in this time. But if this were an ordinary story, then there wouldn't be much to report after this. However, this is where the tale begins. And I'll get into that after this. Hi, I'm Steven, and I am the host of a podcast named The Composer Chronicles. Each Wednesday, I delve into the stories of composers both past and present. Historical episodes focus on a particular work by a featured composer and examines their life during the time the piece was written and performed. Once a month, I feature a living composer and allow them to share their own stories and give personalized insight into the industry. But that's not all. The Composer Chronicles hosts additional miniseries that explore the film and video game music industries that each feature composers and professionals in those fields. So if you're ever asking yourself, why are cannons being used as instruments in Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture? Or what makes a Disney song so catchy? Or even what does one have to do to become a composer? Then The Composer Chronicles is the show for you. You can stream The Composer Chronicles wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. So, come and join me, and together we'll pull back the curtain on the world's greatest music makers. And now, back to the story. So going back a couple years, one night a local pastor named Ishvan Magyari was summoned to the Bathory estate after a young servant girl had suddenly passed away. So the pastor traveled to perform the final rites for this young girl, but what was strange was that when he got there, the girl was already sealed into a coffin. And again, this was strange because traditionally a person would be laid out on a bed for their final rites and then sealed and buried. And Elizabeth happened to be on the scene when the pastor arrived and she explained that the young girl had died of cholera and she didn't want to cause a fuss. So then the girl was quietly and quickly buried. But inside the castle, the different female servants were whispering nervously amongst each other and ducking their heads down when Elizabeth passed by. 
Then another death happened, and when the men were sent to bury the next coffin, it turned out that this coffin actually had two girls kept inside. And when asked about this, Elizabeth said that the two girls were buried together to save space and to stop the servants from causing a fuss. When one of the men was about to question her, he was warned by one of his companions to stop because, quote, it would go badly for the servants. During this time, it seems that young peasant women would go missing quite frequently, and there were very high rates of burials and funerals continuing in the area, but Elizabeth dodged any sort of suspicions. She said that she took great care of those under her domain, and during the time, it was common for people to die due to disease at a pretty high rate. But even these rates seemed to be alarming, and disease was usually the excuse that Elizabeth used. She even attended multiple funeral services, so she looked like this caring, grieving mistress of the house. But at this point, rumors were starting to spread about strange happenings within the castle. People claimed that there was torture going on behind closed doors, and some people... Vroom, vroom, Mr. Motorcycle Man. And some people thought this was getting too concerning to ignore. So the same priest from before, Ishtvan, was calling upon Elizabeth one day for permission to exhume some of the bodies. But Elizabeth was so furious that somebody would deign to suspect her, she wrote to her husband demanding that Ishtvan be punished. And her letter was apparently so serious that Ferenc hustled home. And it would have been a shock to Ferenc to come home and discover that his wife was at the center of so many terrible rumors, right? Well, the thing is, Ferenc actually wasn't in his he was actually thought to share similar interests with Elizabeth when it came to bizarre torture and behaviors. Apparently, Ferenc regularly tortured servants and had even taught Elizabeth ways to torture that he had learned on the battlefield. It was said that Ferenc would sometimes go as far as to dance with the dead bodies of his enemies or even play games of catch with their decapitated heads. He even gifted Elizabeth with a sort of glove that had claws so she could cut and stab her victims. However, it was supposed that Ferenc would actually forbid his wife from killing the young girls that she would torture. But by the time of his death in 1604, Elizabeth didn't have anybody to act as her impulse control and the numbers of death in the area would just skyrocket. Now, some people suspect that Elizabeth could have been a victim of her husband at some point during their marriage because tragically, there were no laws or regulations that would forbid husbands from abusing their wives. So some people speculate that this might have been Elizabeth's way of coping with her own abuse and restoring some feeling of empowerment or control. But regardless, Elizabeth's abuse of the young women would certainly go from dangerous to fatal. And even though Elizabeth often made excuses for her actions and tried to hide it, there were still people that wanted to call her out and demand some form of justice. But Elizabeth couldn't be held accountable for anything done to somebody below nobility. So there was a horrific stalemate that sadly protected Elizabeth and her terrible habits, especially considering that she had the protection of her husband for most of her reign of terror. In the beginning, descriptions of torture were, although still terrifying, much smaller. Elizabeth was said to stick needles into women's lips and under their nail beds. When she would inject the needle underneath a girl's nail bed and the girl obviously cried out in pain, she would ask if they would like to remove the needle and thinking obviously yes you'd want that taken out. After the needle was removed she would cut the finger off entirely. She would also burn her victims or cut them or use physical violence like biting, slapping, and kicking. But as Elizabeth grew older in an age where people died quite young and supposedly as her mind began to weaken she seemed to act in in a desperately violent sort of way. Elizabeth developed a group of accomplices who would aid in torturing these young girls, including a boy named Janos Ujvari, her children's own wet nurse, Iana Jonaji, one of Iana's friends, Dotea Schnetis, and an elderly servant named Karolin Bezhnetsky. There was also another woman named Anna who was considered to be the most brutal of the group and was usually the one that taught the others methods of torture. But one thing that always continued to motivate Elizabeth was her desire to maintain her beauty, or supposedly. It was said that Elizabeth one day slapped a servant so hard that blood splattered onto her face and she noticed that as she wiped it her skin looked remarkably well side note please for the love of all that is holy do not try this at home this was just what elizabeth thought apparently and this probably isn't even factual to elizabeth's story but anyway this is not a suggestion or me condoning any of this for legal reasons just in case somebody decides to be crazy i don't want to be blamed for anything please don't do this please just use retinol serums or something or just embrace aging because it's a normal thing no blood no blood i mean it don't do it i know no one's going to need that disclaimer but you know cya Eventually, Elizabeth decided that peasant blood just wasn't cutting it anymore, and the blood of nobles would work so much better. Again, supposedly, because there are reports that Elizabeth did never really bother to collect the blood. 
but she eventually did start seeking out more higher ranking victims and her punishments for her victims would only get worse. In one instance, Elizabeth had a girl stand naked outside in the middle of winter and repeatedly drenched with cold water until she froze to death. Some girls were burned with molten iron, some even being forced to open their mouths and eat molten iron and let it burn them from the inside out. Some girls were starved or deprived of water. Girls would have their fingers, hands, or even limbs cut off. They would have their hands smashed and then forced to sew, and then when they didn't turn out perfect stitches, they would be beaten again. They would be made to sometimes roll across a floor covered in pins. Some would be forced to cook and eat parts of their own flesh. And one of the most horrific treatments of all, girls would be slathered in honey and then covered by bees and ants, and then slowly bitten and stung to death. Elizabeth also knew that the clergy would be suspicious if she continued to ask for burials, so the bodies would then be disposed of in ditches, nearby woods and gardens, or wherever there was space to do so. Those who had escaped from the castle had clear evidence in their wounds and disfigurations. It was clear that something needed to be done. And what's so crazy about all of this is that, by all means, this depraved, horrific woman had a stellar public record. She gave money to charities, especially for destitute women. She provided health care for her staff, I mean, aside from the ones that she was torturing, and for people that lived in villages under her domain. She attended functions with her husband, and she attended church. In fact, one of her acquaintances said of his own daughter that she should be more like Urtzebet. So this gives us an idea of why it took so long for something to be done. Now, this doesn't mean that people weren't suspicious, though. Those girls who had escaped were leaving Elizabeth's service either permanently disfigured or disabled, and there were rumors that you could hear the screams from outside the castle, and dogs and wolves would regularly dig up bodies. So Elizabeth wouldn't be able to keep this a secret forever. In the year 1610, we meet a man named Jorgi Thurzo, who had actually been asked by Elizabeth's late husband to look after her and their children when he died. So Thurzo went to investigate at Elizabeth's castle, and he was a very powerful man. He was the Palatine of Hungary, and someone who was actually very close to the king of Hungary himself. He sent some letters to obtain permission to investigate, saying of Elizabeth, quote, she through some sort of evil spirit has set aside her reverence of God and man and killed in many cruel and various ways many girls and virgins and other women, end quote. Third, so then ordered a couple of men to gather witnesses, and this was significant because they were looking for statements from every vroom vroom motorcycle man. You're so cool. He's just mocking me now. They were looking for statements from basically anybody. Male, female, peasant, clergy, noble, whoever could testify. And Elizabeth must have caught wind of this because she started to get her affairs in order. She possibly bribed the mother of a young woman whom she had tortured to make a statement saying that her daughter had died of natural causes. And she also wrote her will and placed everything under the ownership of her 12-year-old son, possibly so the king couldn't confiscate her property and so she would seem like less of a target. But eventually, Thurzo showed up at her door and laid the accusation against her. And apparently, Elizabeth was quite the actress, being the picture of politeness and serving tea and cake to her guest. She said that a girl had gone on a murderous rampage over stealing jewelry from other girls in the castle, and after she stole them, she murdered all the girls so she could have them, but then killed herself to avoid being caught. There wasn't really anything that Thurso could do, so he just left. But did Elizabeth learn from her mistakes? Not at all. Apparently, in a rage after nearly being caught, she killed four more girls and had their bodies thrown over the side of the castle in the hope of having the wolves drawn to them. But it wasn't the wolves who saw the bodies, rather a group of villagers. So this was reported and Thurzo had to make a U-turn and go back to the castle, this time with the proof that he needed. However, what he and his men saw wasn't just proof, but a living nightmare. When the men entered the manor property, they found the bodies of the four girls all either dead or on the brink of death, and they all appeared to have been beaten, flogged, burnt, and stabbed, and they would only find more corpses within the castle walls, reporting cruel injuries such as severely burnt hands, shoulder blades and cheeks that had been removed with pliers, necks that were strangled, and hands bound so tightly that blood burst from the fingertips. They found a few girls who were still alive and able to identify their torturers, and Elizabeth, despite the evidence clear clearly being against her, maintained her innocence, even claiming at one point that she let her accomplices carry on torturing because she was afraid of being tortured by them herself. However, in late December of 1610, she was formally arrested. 
In a turning of the tables, Elizabeth's torturous assistants soon faced torture themselves until they finally confessed their involvement in all the deaths of so many young women. When it came to the overall death toll, the witnesses accounted for around 175 at minimum to about 300 girls who had died. But the highest amount is estimated to be nearly 650. The one who stated this was Elizabeth herself, and based on her character, I think we might not ever truly know whether that's accurate, and it's just so horrible to think about that, how many girls not only suffered at Elizabeth's hand, but would disappear from the world because we wouldn't ever know their names, and it's something that's really horrible to think about. Those who had helped Elizabeth were condemned to death, but not before having their fingers ripped out first. All except for one, but we don't have a concrete record of what happened to her. She likely died or was privately released. And Elizabeth herself would be sentenced to live in her castle for the rest of her life. She couldn't really be sentenced to death due to her status, even though she did such horrible things. But Thurzo said to her as he announced her sentence, quote, You are like a wild animal. You are in the last months of your life. You do not deserve to breathe air on earth or see the light of the Lord. You shall disappear from this world and shall never reappear in it again. As the shadows envelop you, may you find time to repent your bestial life. I hereby condemn you to lifelong imprisonment in your own castle. The story goes that Elizabeth was bricked up in her room, but was still given plenty of supplies to live on. But it's also possible that she may have just been under house arrest. But people like to say that she was given a great deal of pen and paper to write. And it's said that when she wrote a massive amount of letters protesting her innocence, when she ran out of paper, she eventually started writing on the walls. And for two and a half years, she lived this way. But on one August night in 1614, she complained to her guard saying, look how cold my hands are. And he told her that it was nothing and that she should lie down. So she did and sang softly in a beautiful voice before she passed away peacefully. Where she was truly buried remains a mystery to us to this day. And there we have the story of Elizabeth Bathory whose legend may be as equally horrific as her reality, and who reminds us that the monsters we should be most afraid of are most likely going to look like you and me. Yikes. So, okay, how to transition out of that one? Um, uh, go check out Steven's podcast page, The Composer Chronicles. I think we could all use something more uplifting after this, and Steven is a great podcast, and he's just very nice, so I completely recommend you go check it out. If you liked this episode, please feel free to like, follow, comment, subscribe. Every platform is a little bit different. I post a lot on my podcast Instagram page at Tea Time Thoughts Podcast, and one thing I do pretty often just just post funny literature or history memes. So you can definitely go check that out. I think we all probably need a reason to chuckle after this. Actually, one thing I'm going to do when I was researching this, I found a portrait of Ferenz and I lost my crap for a couple of minutes because this is the most geometric looking man I've ever seen in my life. Oh my gosh. I... I know I only found it so funny because I was really uncomfortable with everything and I just needed something to laugh at, but I will post a picture. <laughs> I will post a picture on my Instagram post for this episode. And if you happen to be watching from my YouTube video, I will stick the picture up for you to see because I just think we could all use a chuckle and we should make fun of a man who was not very kind. So go for it. Bully for Renz. And yeah, if you'd like to um, subscribe to my YouTube channel as well, I post my episodes there so they're more easy to access if you have geographic blocking. And I eventually kind of want to transition into perhaps doing some video essays or something there. I can't guarantee if slash when that'll happen, but if you are interested in hearing something about that, feel free to subscribe. It's just the Tea Time Thoughts podcast. And in the meantime, if you want to leave me a rating, that would be great. That really does help to boost the podcast. Go to ratethispodcast.com com slash tea time thoughts and don't forget to tune in next time when i talk about the great gatsby i'm actually going to do it this time pinky promise you can't see this but i'm holding my pinky to my microphone so this is for real all right so thank you guys again for listening this is tea time thoughts and i'll talk to you next time (laughs) 